Hi everyone. Today we're talking about um, how you can manage a software project, or I suppose any kind of project, um, whether long term or short term. And the ten tips that are written down are currently um, on your screen, so you can read through them. And we'll be talking. Um, I suppose I'll be providing context to each one of these. This primarily works um, for a software project, uh, particularly if you've never done a reasonably long-term project. But it should work for other things, um, research projects, um, if you're writing a book, or something along those lines. Um, and they are not in any particular order, um, I've just written them down as I've thought about them. So number one is manage scope. When you're creating a project, you're typically going to be um, designing various features that the project has or will have. And it is important to be not um, too ambitious, particularly if you're limited in terms of time. And even if you don't have a particular deadline to work against, it's helpful to design um, the thing that you're going to produce to have as few features as possible. Just focus on the ones that are important uh, for that particular project. Number two is to develop features one by one rather than trying to um, develop all of them at once or focusing on more than one thing at a time. That allows you to um, design the feature to complete um, the implementation of that feature and then test it and then you can kind of put it away um, in terms of well it's finished so you don't need to touch that particular feature again and that helps and um, that's commonly called feature driven development um, I mean if you're interested in different types of development you could try that but whichever development type or methodology you're going to use thing in terms of features as something that you need to start complete and then move on to something else. <clears throat> it just helps structure your work um, in the longer term. And I suppose depending on how many um, months or years you're going to be working on this thing, um, the guidelines and these sort of various pieces of advice will um, need to be tweaked because if you're thinking an undergraduate project that's um, around nine months a postgraduate project if it's a master's degree then you're thinking sort of um, one one and a half years and then you've got a PhD project which is usually between three and four years <coughs> um, yeah, so deadline is not a single date. Um, the longer your project is going to be, the uh, bigger the errors are going to be in terms of um, how you define the range for your deadline. So it's not going to be a specific date um, against which you're going to be developing. And it's helpful to think of the deadline as a range of, um, well, I suppose a range between two dates. And it usually takes longer compared to, say, um, a piece of assignment that you do for university, for example. Because, you know, there are certain milestones and dates and deadlines you have to meet. And when we set those deadlines for the assignments, we know exactly the learning outcomes of that piece of work. So we know it's, it can be completed within the time allocated. Whereas with projects that you are given in the industry or something that you develop on your own, you don't know um, all the solutions to all the problems they're going to encounter. So it is likely that it's going to take longer than planned. So keep that in mind. Number four is manage risk and setbacks will happen. So things, unexpected things can happen and probably will happen. So we need to manage potential risks. So what happens if your hard drive breaks or something um, that you use as storage 
if it breaks, then you will need to make sure that you have um, other copies of your work so you can continue so that you don't lose too much of progress. Um, other things could be what if the piece of software that you're going to use, something like a library, is no longer available for whatever reason, or if something that you're planning to use, like a piece of kit, hardware, um, maybe that is not going to be available for the entire period of your development. So keep that in mind um, and try to write a list of these things that, things that can go wrong potentially at the beginning of your project. And then for each item that you've written, also write down uh, a possible action to mitigate um, what if something goes wrong kind of thing. What are you going to do? And that helps because you no longer need to think about that during the actual development. So what you're trying to do, uh, and what of these are kind of uh, about that thing where you're trying to move all the stuff that you can do up front to the beginning of the project so that most of your project time is actually focused on development, solving problems, uh, and stuff like that. Number five is manage focus. Uh, by focus, I mean focusing on a particular feature. Well, for example, you're going to have a list of features for your project and some of them are not as important as others and that's something that you need to keep in mind. So we need to prioritize things. We need to move the features that you really need to have without which the project won't actually work according, according to um, specification. These features should move to the top of the list um, and hence be a priority. Everything else, uh, the features that you would like to have and kind of really are going to uh, improve the whole user experience of the software. I mean, it really depends on what you're producing in the end. It could be a book. Uh, if it's a book, then maybe it's sections that are not really important for the reader to understand the whole thing. They're helpful, but you know, there are other core sections that you can focus on. So managing focus here means identify the critical sections of your project and focus on them first to make sure that they are finished before the deadline. Number six is my favorite. Do a bit of work each day rather than out of work in a single day. Um, I tend to work in chunks. That is helpful because when you multiply small chunks by a large number of things, um, in, other, uh, in our case that would be a number of days, then you actually get quite a lot of work done um, over a period of time. Whereas if you're thinking um, to kind of move everything to a single day and then relax the other days, I mean, it could work. It really depends on your kind of work style and work ethics. Um, but doing a lot of work in a single day typically means I'm going to be tired and the output, the quality of the work produced is not going to be very high. And um, I'm generally focused on the high quality of work um, rather than the quantity of it. But it really depends on um, the context because if you have a tight deadline, you probably want to get the work done regardless of its quality because you, you have to really submit that thing um, by a specific date. Number seven is backup work, which is kind of like a mitigating um, thing from number four. And that relates to anything that we do as computer scientists. Um, one of the things, well, almost all the things that we do um, is going to be, is going to end up in a digital form, right? Whether it's code, a 3D model, um, a book even, Everything is done using a computer, more or less. So you don't want to lose your work, your progress, and stuff like that, which is why you need to back up often. Whether it's automated, manual, um, or however you want to do 
the actual backup doesn't really matter. As long as you have a copy from which you can fully restore your project. Uh, GitHub is one way of doing it. Um, and then if you have a third copy, the second copy being your local copy that you work on, and the third copy could be something like um, a cloud storage service that you, you like. I mean, there are plenty, just choose one. Number eight is if stuck, talk to people. That is more related to like mind block or whatever it's called uh, in writing terms. Writer's block, maybe. So if you're stuck on a particular issue, feature, something that you can't implement, something you can't solve, it's really difficult to then continue because um, you had planned everything by then, which means the future parts of the project are based on the issue they are currently solving, the task they are currently working on, and if you can't solve it, then you can't really continue. So that hinders progress. That in turn will um, make you feel, well, not good, because particularly if you're a progress-oriented person, that comes back in a loop and makes you stuck even more because if you don't have the right level of enthusiasm, motivation, it's very actually difficult to solve problems. Because problem solving, uh, you can do it when you're really interested in solving that problem. Otherwise, it's you know, it becomes just like a routine almost. So talking to people or anything that you like to do to relax. But I've chosen specifically talking to people because if you're in a group, like if you're working on an undergraduate project uh, or a research project, um, then you're likely to be in some kind of a group, whether it's supervisory group or um, like a cohort um, of people in your course. Then you can talk to them and chances are they're going to be struggling with the same type um, of problem. Maybe it's going to be a different problem, but generally when you explain um, when you explain that there's something that's hindering your progress, people are actually inclined to also um, talk about the same things that they're experiencing at that time. And chances are they're going to be stuck at, at a similar issue or if their project, if their project is different, then um, it might be a different issue that they're stuck on. But it's important to just be able to talk it out as it were. Um, it's kind of like taking some weight off of you and then kind of just throwing it on the ground because the other person is not going to pick up the weight, but at least it's not on you anymore. And whether it's done locally or online, locally meaning um, sort of among the group that you're working with, um, online, like various forums they can find online. Um, and it's not the same as asking a question on Stack Overflow. That's a completely different thing. Like, like that's a technical question. This refers to just empathizing with people kind of thing. Because, you know, software developers, computer scientists, we tend to be more on the introverted side and more focused on talking just to people that we already know rather than uh, talking to everyone. So I think that's um, a good skill to have and also it's going to help you um, along the way. It's not going to solve the problem um, unless the other person is having exactly the same problem and has figured out a solution. But at least it will allow you to get a perspective on your problem. And ultimately, you're either going to solve, it problem, solve the problem technically, or you're going to find another way of dealing with that um, issue. If we're thinking research project, for example, you can find an alternative way of solving a problem without really solving it. As in, you can find an alternative route to reach your destination without going down the route that you initially thought of. That's what PhD is about, really, um, finding different ways of getting to your destination. Um, yeah, and before I get to number nine, 
there is one thing that I wanted to talk about about number six actually that I just remembered in terms of doing a bit of work each day. If you can find there is a large task that you can't complete, it's usually helpful to decompose it to its atomic components, as in two parts that can be solved um, in a single kind of in a single session. Um, decomposition is taking a large problem and removing its components or separating its components into small parts. Because I remember I gave a talk uh, a while ago to non-computer scientists and when I said decomposing a problem um, I got very dodgy looks so I had to explain what decomposition means in that context. Apparently not um, other sort of disciplines don't use that term. So number nine is set up environment and most ideally um, sorry set up the environment for the software project that you're going to be working on, or I know if you're writing a book, uh, then set up whatever it is you're going to use to write the book. And set up most of the workflows at the start. And if you can set up all of them, then that's even better. Because again, that moves some of the work that you need to do anyway down the line to the beginning of the line. And that allows you to just focus on the development later on. At the start, you want to also set up things like tests, your CI pipeline, um, your environment as in your ID, the languages they are going to use, the SDKs they are going to use, the libraries, the dependencies. If you set up everything at the start, then it's much easier to also test. As in, you can just write a Hello World app and then run all of your environment stuff on it to make sure that everything works. And because there's only just hello world in there, it's quite easy to debug. There's nothing else to debug really. But if you have some um, code base written already uh, and you're kind of in the middle of all of this, you're really, really excited to implement a, a solution because you've already solved the problem on, uh, uh, using a pen and paper. And then you get stuck because your tests are not working or your CI environment is failing for some reason. That is kind of, you know, it's going, it's going to change the development mood, as it were, and change the pace of development. So you don't want to have these obstacles on your way in the middle of development. And um, it's also going to be harder if you have some code base and you're trying to add new environment features like CI uh, on top of it. Um, CI is continuous integration by the way. Um, it's In simple terms it's a build server that sits somewhere uh, possibly if you're using GitHub then GitHub Actions could be used as a build server and then it just takes the latest bit of your code, runs it and tests it, well compiles, tests and possibly even deploys um, if needed. Right, and the final tip, which is number 10, write down all specifications in a concise and precise way and do that at the very start again. Because whether you're on your own or in a team, you want to know exactly what you're going to be doing. Um, because as you start a development, your trajectory may change or you may forget about what the feature was supposed to be. So if the feature is something like um, input validation, then somewhere down the line in two years time, you might think, okay, I'm going to implement input validation now. You've implemented it and you did that from user's perspective. So that when a user enters something in your program, its input is validated. But you actually, but what you actually wanted two years back uh, was input validation of the incoming data from the back end. So, you know, stuff gets forgotten. And if you write down the specification in a very concise way, like one sentence or two sentences, and very precise, uh, in a very precise way, so exactly specifying what bits needs to, uh, need to be done and um, what they need to do. If the specification is a bit too long because the issue is too complex, then again, decompose it 
take it apart into multiple um, atomic things, atomic tasks that you can complete, and specify them specify them in, in that way. <clears throat> and I think that is it uh, for managing a project. These are things that have helped me during my PhD, during um, various other projects that I do, and hopefully they will help you as well in the future. If there is something that I missed, something that has worked for you uh, from your experience, then you're very welcome to comment that um, down below in the comment section. On that note, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see everyone um, in the next video.